Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Kelly. Uh, I am the Community Relations Program host at the Rochester Hills Public Library, and I would like to welcome you to this afternoon's presentation, Shades, Detroit Love Stories, with local writer Esperanza Citron and co-host Michael Dwyer, founder of Rochester Writers. Esperanza will begin with reading selections from her book, followed by a Q&A uh, with Michael. I think how we'll be doing that is Esperanza will read a work. Uh, Michael will talk with her a little about that, elaborate it. We'll go back and forth on that. And at the end, we'll open up uh, just a Q&A and we'll answer any questions you have. You can leave questions for that in the chat feature and we'll take note of those and ask like the questions that sound good at the end. Um, we would first like to thank the Friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library for supporting our programs through their many fundraising efforts. We greatly appreciate their support. Uh, you can register for our upcoming programs by visiting calendar.rhpl.org. Uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m., we'll be co-hosting a Zoom presentation with jazz trumpeter Curtis Taylor. You can access the program directly following the link provided on our calendar of events. Uh, there is no pre-registration for that program. Uh, but this afternoon, all attendees will remain muted throughout the program. Uh, again, you can feel free to ask the chat questions in the uh, chat feature below. Uh, once we get started, I'll leave a little message that'll let you know where it is. Uh, and then this program will be uh, recorded, and this program will also be available to view on the library's YouTube channel about a week from today. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Esperanza and Michael, and I'm going to hand it uh, directly over to Esperanza. Hi, I'm Esperanza Cintron, and I'm going to be reading uh, a piece from the book Shades. Uh, it's Detroit love stories. And of course, love is a very broad term, okay? Because there are all, all kinds of love. And the first piece I wanna read is called The Crossroad. Um, I'm gonna do the best I can, cause you know, this whole thing is kind of weird here. And I have to take off my glasses to read one of those things. Okay. The church is full of grandma. Her long white box sits on a pedestal in the front. I can see her dark brown face peeking out, the tip of her nose and a shiny chocolate cheek. There are lots of flowers, carnations with stiff pink ribbons. She liked carnations because they last a long time. Roses, white and red and loose petal yellow flowers are spread all around the box and across the stage circling the preacher's place. They smell pretty, sweet and fresh. I don't know where mama is. I, I can't see her nowhere. Wide, round, purple, blue, and black Sunday best hats nod, making soft waves that wash over rows of ladies in navy and black dresses. Every once in a while, there's a splash of green or deep purple or a man pressed tight in a dark suit and tie with a high button white shirt and brushed back hair. An old, old lady with balled up paper brown Paper bag brown skin is sitting across the aisle from us. She is wearing a wide navy hat with a big puffy organdy flower pasted right on the front. She is humming a low song that I can't make out. Her voice is rusty and wet. I'm sitting on a bench, scrunched between two church ladies wearing white uniforms. Crochet doilies are pinned to their breast pockets and their crispy dresses. Pearl-like buttons go all the way down the front only ankles in white stockings and thick heeled shoes peek out. One of them keeps pressing my face against the crocheted doily on her pocket. It's stiff, not soft like it looked. I try to wiggle my face away so I can breathe better, but the other church lady's bosom is guarding the other side. I stare down at the tiny white pearl colored buttons on her wide white lap. I have a new black patent leather T-strap shoes and my turquoise blue dress with the long waist. Grandma called it my jazzy dress, said it looked like one she used to have when she was a girl. She showed me how to wear the long beads that came with it. When I tried the dress on in the store, Grandma took the necklace and put it around her neck. She wrapped it so that one part was close to her throat and the other hung down to her waist. Then she put one hand on her hip and pretended like she was chewing gum with, while she took the long part of the necklace in her hand and twirled it around. She winked at me and said, that's the way the fast girls did it. I laughed. 
and then she twirled the beads around and made a cockeyed face. I laughed harder because she looked so funny. Then she picked me up and twirled me around. The beads feel smooth and bumpy. I smile. I hear mama crying somewhere. I turn to look for her and she's there in the aisle held up by two church ladies in white. Mama's face is red and crumbly. Her mouth open wide crying. Her friend Belle is coming up the aisle behind him. Diane, she call out to mama. Mama shake loose the church lady so that she can hug Belle. Mama's face, mama's crying on Belle's shoulder. Belle hug her back. Oh, slow eyed Deacon Harris. That's what grandma used to call him because he's always trying to get with mama come up behind them and hand mama his herkerchief. She take it and blow her nose. Diane, I got her, he say, and try to take mama from Bill, but mama won't go. I want my mama. I start crying, I want my mama. I'm standing on the wooden seat trying to climb over these church ladies, but they won't let me get to my mama. One of them holding me by my waist and making me even more hot and sweaty, and the other lady is blocking my way. They won't let me get to my mama. This lady saying, baby, come on, sit down here. You can't have your mama right now. So I scream and cry and scream louder because I want my mama and she right there and they won't let me have her. Shh, the lady in white crooned in my ear. She tried to rock me against the bumpy smoothness of her dress and she wiped my nose with a handkerchief. Don't Sister Green look good? My other keeper say, Swanson did a good job. Sister Green would be real proud. I peek out at grandma who is looking pretty and peaceful and I quiet down because I know she would want me to. A good woman, say one of the church ladies, tired till it hurt and all those kids, she deserve a nice send off. A crew of church lady nurses stand along the back wall, hands behind their back, a line of straight white posts holding the church up. I'm wondering where they get the cold rags and smelling sauce they give to people who faint when they get the Holy Ghost. Grandma would be standing there with them if she wasn't resting in her pretty box. Her hair is all shiny and curled, like when she get it done on Saturdays. I smile and remember how Grandma used to say getting her hair done once a week was her one indulgence. A treat, she said it meant. Like the little brown bag of penny squirrels and banana slips, uh, splits she used to give me when she came home from the beauty parlor. Grandma was always teaching me new words and other things, like the capital of Colombia is Bogota. Colombia is a country way down south. She liked to tell me, read to me, and tell me about other places. Bogota. I like the way that word sounds in my mouth. Uncle Jeff's sitting up straight and crisp in his white Navy uniform. His face is quiet and serious, his mouth a straight line. He nod his head up and down every time Aunt Jamie whispers something in his ear, but he won't turn to look at her. Aunt Jamie looked nice in the dark blue suit she borrowed from Mama. Uncle Ronald is sitting next to her with some lady I don't know. Mama say every time she turned around, Ronald got a new girlfriend. Uncle Ronald paint crazy pictures with weird mismatched colors. Mama say he, he can't see straight because he always high on that reefer. But grandma said he just trying to make sense out of a crazy world. The organ music starts. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. The people in the choir stand up. One of my keepers take my hand and we sit, stand and sing along with the choir. It sounds good, full and loud. And I smile because grandma is smiling. The preacher's purple and black robes swirl around him as he takes his place in front of the tall stand that looked like the thick trunk of a tree growing out of grandma's box. We have come together this day to celebrate the life of this good woman, to rejoice in the fact that we were fortunate enough to have this gracious woman touch our lives. Let us begin with the prayer of benediction a pronouncement of his divine blessing. His words sound like a song as he bowed his head and stretched his palms out to us. We bow our heads too. I can feel grandma's warm palm squeezing my hand, reminding me to be quiet, to bow my head and let the gentle beauty of prayer 
wash over me. Okay. Wendell. Absolutely <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. That's sweet. Um, Shades is the title of the book, and that was just one story. It's a collection of interconnected short stories. Can you tell us how you put the collection together? Uh, yeah. There, it's like, it happened over many years, actually, because I've written a lot of in, other things in between. But they're based on people that I grew up with in my communities and so forth. And they're stories that, that people told me, and I sort of embellished them, you know, uh, trying to capture... So it's, it's just, I would write a story and then years would pass and then I would write another story. And eventually I had a book, I guess. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it is a book right here. <laughs> um, that piece that you just read, The Crossroad, um, it sounded so personal. Is that one of your stories or, or one that you embellished that you heard? Well, they're all embellished and they're all personal because, I don't know, as a writer, I think you put a piece of you in anything that you write. Um, they're, they're, I guess, part of my community. Do you know what I mean? Uh, my community is, yeah, my communities, if you will. So, yeah, th it's personal in that sense. And we were as readers, as listeners to you reading, we were transported. I, I think I can speak for everyone tuning in. We were right there in that church. We were sitting in the cool. pew listening um, to this story and, and we could see the flowers, we could smell the flowers, we could hear uh, all of this chatter that was going on that you described, uh, as well as I felt you know, the, the coolness of a church and the warmth of the people around me. Um, what a wonderful job you did of, of transporting us there. Thank you. <laughs> it's very sweet of you to say that. Um, tell us more about uh, Shade's Detroit love stories. And um, this is that last piece you read. It's a love story of a, of a granddaughter and a grandma. Right, um, exactly. What are some of the other relationships in the book? Well, the primary characters are uh it starts off with uh the primary three women i guess bell margaret and diane okay and they live in a um i guess what you call a four family flat okay and the stories are based on it starts with them it starts with bell and margaret and they're going out to a club at night this all takes place in the 60s right starts in the 1960s i don't know exactly when in the 60s but thereabouts you know and um, it's, it's on, it starts on the, um, like the east side of Detroit kind of thing. And I don't know, it's, the book is divided by east side, west side. Traditionally in Detroit, if you know, uh, Woodward stretches the center, right? Okay, and you've got the east side of Woodward and the west side of Woodward. Growing up, um, people from the south, they lived on the east side of Woodward. So it was considered a more, a rougher, more rustic kind of thing because most of the people, especially I'm talking primarily about the African-Americans were Southerners and they called it up South, right? Well, when you got money and stuff, you moved to the West side because the houses were nicer and the schools were better. So you had to move up to the West side, you know? So um, it starts on the East side because not necessarily because all of those things are true because there are rich people that lived on the east side too, you know what I mean? But theoretically, the east side was someplace you moved away from. Is that making sense? It is. My, yeah, so the stories, like I said, there are three women and it's about them, them um, living, surviving. It's about them trying to um, become the people that they, they want to become. They're raising their kids and their kids. Uh, eventually, the last story in the book is Diane's daughter, and she ends up in New York. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's about living life. And I guess my whole point was just trying to <sighs> reveal the humanity of these individuals, to make them human, so that everybody could see themselves in them. Like you said, you could see the flowers, you could hear the things. Yeah, I want you to feel like you're 
in them. Does that make sense? Well, absolutely. And I, th I think you, you, you hit it right on the head there. We were there. We were with you. Um, for me, it was, it was very real, but almost a dreamlike, like a memory. Oh, okay. So you instilled that memory in me, and, and I was able to share that experience. Um, and I miss Grandma, too. <laughs> I miss both of mine. They're both gone. But, yeah. So, yeah. Grandma's cool. You know. <laughs> they but, are. Uh, I don't know. So. so we've got another piece. Do you want to give us a little introduction to the next piece and then read it? Okay. Um, this one is called Loose in Progress. Um, loose in Spanish, of course, means light, but it's this little girl's name. I, I decided to read you two little girls because the first little girl and this is the second little girl. And this one is on the west side, but this is more southwest Detroit. She's at Puerto Rican um, growing up in southwest Detroit. Because, you know, my heritage is I'm um, Afro-Latina, Afro-Boricua, okay, which means that... Um, I'm a black Latin, right? So my heritage is both. And I kind of straddle because I think that both cultures are so rich. I don't want to lose anything. I don't want to lose any part of who I am. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this one is a little more risque, if you will. Um, so I hope I don't def uh, offend any ears. Um, but it, it's also the story of a little girl growing up and trying to deal with the difficulties that she encounters in her life. And then, if you understand right, what I'm saying? Yes? I do. Okay. I'm ready to hear it. Oh. <laughs> See, I do, it's like this, I was, like I was telling uh, Joe, these things are kind of, it's kind of personal because I'm like revealing perceptions that I don't share. It's also, I don't normally... This is not, these are things that you don't kind of share outside of the community, you know what I mean? And so it's kind of, okay, I'm gonna read. <laughs> well, let me get a swallow so my throat can, okay. I'm lying here on my stomach. Legs stretch the length of the yellow formica dinner table. My feet don't quite reach the end. I rest my chin on my hands and press my fingers into the cold, hard surface. It feels clean and safe up here. I'm being really quiet. He never shouts at me to get off the table. And if I'm really quiet, he ignores me and lets me listen. He is practicing one of his songs while he gets his outfit ready for tonight's show. The song is soft light and really pretty. Torch song, he calls it. I watch him through my eyelashes so he won't see me watching. He already knows I'm listening. He has on a black bustier with little white threads running all through it and a matching thong that pushes his stuff out in front and shows the smooth line of his butt in the back. The skin looks so smooth and clean and soft that I want to touch it. As he comes closer, singing, soft, sad, singing his soft, sad song, I just reach out little by little and run my hand down the length of the closest butt cheek. He swats at the place I touched like he's fanning at a fly. But when he sees it, it was just me, he, he just smirks, shakes his head and keeps smoothing out the long dress because he knows I'm, a, I'm just a kid and it don't mean nothing. The skin is smooth and firm and feels really nice. Without opening my eyes any wider, I stroke it once more and then I just pull my hand back to my side. When he finishes his song, and the sparkly dress is falling nicely from his hanger. He stands there looking down at me. I open my eyes and wait. You know, Luz, he says to me, that place Manolo goes to, it ain't a real job. He turns tricks. And then he just picks up his little black cotton kimono with the fuchsia birds on the back and pulls it on. I look at him. I'm only eight and a girl. But I know what turning tricks is, and my brother Manny don't do it. He is a man. He ain't no fag like Australia here who dresses up like a lady and sings in bars. Manny is a man with muscles on both his arms 
who can still pick me up and who pays the rent and buys the food when mommy spends the check getting high or don't come home. I look at Estrella, who is bending over by the refrigerator, pulling out a beer. I want to spit on that lion punk. I'm sitting up now and I'm mad, wondering why he, he say something out the blue like that about Manny. I want to ask him why, but instead I say, Manny says fags always think everybody is like them. De dijo Luz, he says to me. I ain't no fag, I'm a cross-dresser. I like to wear women's clothes. They make me feel the part, makes me seem better. Fag, I taunt. I like women, he pouts. You know Lupito es mi novia. Why you want to say that about Manny? I have to ask. Because it's true. I thought you were my friend. One tear. I'm not crying. I am. Want something to drink? Any hambre, he asked. I don't want your nasty food. I'm down off the table and headed towards the door. Where are you going to go, Luce? Your mommy's not home. And Manny's probably trying to get some sleep before work, he says, pulling some stuff out of the fridge. Why you say that about Manny? I thought you should know. So when your little friend at school or somebody from the neighborhood throws it at you, you'll be ready for him. I stand there a long time, not saying nothing. That bendejo Carlito, Julio's brother, saw Manny in the back room with a client last night, Estrella says. Watching him put sandwiches together and warm the milk for the coffee, I think how it's suddenly cold in Estrella's stuffy little apartment. Come on over here and talk to me. But he's not looking at me. He keeps his eyes on what he's doing. I don't move. He stands there with the plates in his hand, looking really tall in the kimono that barely comes to the bottom of his hips. Wiry black hairs curl just inside the front of his bustier. He puts the plates down on the table. I'll make you some coffee with lots of milk and sugar, just like you like it. Sit down. I watch him moving back and forth between the little kitchen place and the table. Manny ain't no fag, I say. I didn't say he was loose. He sets the coffee down. Come on. He sits down in the chair on the other side of the table and waits for me. Finally, I move over to the table and take a seat across from him. We bow our heads, make temples of our hands, and he says, Grace. Heavenly Father, he begins. I'm thinking, please don't let Manny be no fag. He asks him that the food be blessed, and I'm telling God, I don't care about the food. Just make what Estrella said about Manny be a lie. He finishes and I still have my eyes closed. When I open my eyes, he has picked up his sandwiches and is opening it and looking it over like he hadn't just made it himself. It's not the worst thing in the world, Luce. He's real careful. They wear rubber so they don't catch nothing. He puts his sandwich back together and bites it. Drink your coffee, he says to me and puts the cup in front of me. I lean down low over, his, over it. And without picking it up, put my mouth on the rim of the cup and sip. It's really full. And the liquid is hot, sweet, just like I like it. You know, Manny is a good looking man. Those big dark eyes and all that sandy hair. He can make a lot of money. He takes another bite. Manny ain't no man I, yet, I say. He's only 17. He's the man in your house with your mommy strung out like that. Don't know other money come in. She smokes up what, and she smokes up what the state sends her. I'm going to cry if he keeps talking. So I keep staring at the beige liquid like it got, and like it's got an answer. Manny loves you, Luce. Not saying he's doing it just for you, cause he got to eat and sleep too. But stopping all of a sudden, like he ran out of words, he takes a sip of his beer to cover it up, and it's quiet for a long time. I watch a tear drop into my coffee. How did it happen, I ask. He looks at me, and I can see a tender little smile in his eye like he's saying, I knew I could trust you. He didn't want to sell drugs with the counts, what with your mommy and all, and busting tables don't pay nothing, and the guys at the club kept asking him, so one day he just did it. He watches me a while, and then he says, Luce, it's not right. And he would never want you to do something like that. In fact, that's one of the reasons he does it. 
so you won't have to. But Luz, don't hate him. And don't make him feel worse about himself than he already does. I look up at him, and by now I'm really crying. I nod in agreement, and he holds out his arms to me. I run around the table and press my face into the stiff stays of his bustier as he brushes my hair back with his hand. It's only a temporary thing, Luz. Manolo Smart, a survivor, he'll come up with something better before you know it. Okay? So, what do you think? <laughs> I was waiting for the unmute to come up. It was wonderful. Um, and different than the first piece, yeah. where you know we were celebrating life at the end and reminiscing and experiencing death. And here we have a, a very important slice of life happening for all of these individuals right at this moment um, that we've got to understand. And I think you've, you've done it with just enough hint of there's still questions of their lives. Well, I questions. think you, we've experienced this moment in time with these characters and these people and we feel for them and we, and hopefully we can start to relate. But then we also want to know, how does it end? Where is it going? Do things get better? Do things get worse? <laughs> well, there are some answers if you buy the book. <laughs> so, or you get the book from the library. Uh, because there is a follow-up story um, where Man Manolo, um, her brother, there's a follow-up story with him. But I'm not going to tell you what happens. I can't give you all my secrets. You know, but yeah, you're supposed to feel empathy. And I'm not saying sympathy, I'm saying empathy. You're supposed to feel empathy with the little girl and with her brother, Manny. They're having a hard time. They're kids. They're kids and they have to eat and they have to sleep. And they're dealing, they're doing what they have to in order to survive. Um, and it is not... Um, they're not the only ones. There are poor people all over the world that are having difficulties like these. I mean, that are doing what they have to in order to survive, you know? It's, I mean, you think about, we live in, in the US. People shouldn't have to be subjected to these kinds of things. There should be, you know, you would think that we have systems in place, a social services system that's supposed to be supportive, but it's overburdened. Monies are going to the military when they should be going to people. But okay, I'm not going to get on my, uh, uh, whatever, my soapbox. But yeah, I mean. That's what you're reading. It's, you know, that's what these writings do is, is they, they, they put the stories up front so, so people can read them and, and hopefully have empathy for uh, the characters and for other Americans that are in the situation. Um, and you mentioned how these stories started in the 60s, but this is still stories exactly. of today. People are still struggling today, and it's important to make sure people remember that. Right. I mean, definitely. Um, I, when I was writing it, and of course, because it just got published last year, so the publishers obviously felt that the, the stories were still relevant. But when I was writing it, you know, I was concerned about using, you know, words like fag and so forth, because certainly not PC. Um, but I was hoping, too, that people will understand that this is a child speaking and she's trying to lash out. And um, there are things that she doesn't understand about life. And this is how she she's trying to understand them, you know. So she's only eight years old and she's confronted with all of these things that a lot of adults never even encounter, you know, and she has to make sense of them so that she won't hurt the people that she cares about. You know what I'm saying? It's right. It's, and kids repeat what they hear and they, and exactly. And these are words and terms um, that are, are not politically correct, obviously. Exactly. But it is part of life, and it is what people say. 
And if you're going to make the, the stories real, you have to include the dialogue of, of what these folks would say. Exactly. I, I definitely felt that way because I felt like I had to say the words that she would say, you know, and think the, the things that she would say. And that, that is the thing about writing and trying to get into a character, any character. Because um, I, I write across genres, okay? This um, Shades, of course, actually it's been finished for a while, but it was just published last year. But I just finished um, a Western. Uh, it's a Western mystery, actually. And um, it's, it's the story of a, of a young woman who is a, um, an ex-slave. Um, it's actually a takeoff on, on a Willa Cather novel. I took a character from uh, Willa Cather's uh, novel, uh, Sapphire and the Slave Girl. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Willa Cather, but anyway. Uh, so, and I took this character and I took her out west and she settles in a town. And, and um, it's all about her trying to make a life in, um, I think it's Colorado, right? So the thing was getting into her head and getting into her lover's head. Her lover is an, is an exiled Englishman, okay? From, you know, who's the second son and he didn't have any money. So he comes to the West in order to make a, a life for himself, right? So getting into the heads of those two characters, and this is like 1868, all this is happening. It's really difficult because you have to really try to think of the words and the feelings that they would have. And, and obviously this is one of the main characters is, a, is a, an Englishman, an, a, a, an aristocrat, a privileged white man. And it was really hard for me being a uh, Afro-Latina from Detroit to get into his head. But I think that it's a good exercise for anybody to, to try to stretch ourselves and to embody uh, the minds and thoughts of other people. I think more people should write because then we ha you have to do that. Is that making sense? I know I'm talking crazy over here. But... No, no you're, <laughs> no, you're making perfect sense. Um, these characters that we develop in our stories, we don't always have that background, just as you've pointed out. So, you know, it's difficult to write from a perspective, not your own, but very constructive and and you want to get it right, of course. And I'm sure you, you researched it and, or you interviewed oh, yeah. people, right, to, to understand this perspective. Um, and there is some controversy out there in the writing community about you should only write from what you know so that it's a, you have a personal connection to it, that you're not taking away a story from that particular demographic. So if I was to write an Afro-Latino story from a female point of view, I might be taking a story away from you. But that is part of the writing process and storytelling is putting yourself into those other characters. I think that the, the main thing that I heard you say for me was the word research. To me, that is the largest and best thing you can do, okay? I do so much research. I mean, I find actually research glorious and fun, okay? When I started writing the Western, you can't imagine the number of books that I read that took place in the West. And then how I had to research all of Colorado to find out what, the, what kind of fauna, what kind of, what kind of things grow there. And then it took place in the 19th century. So I had to research all the clothing that they wore down to the, the knickers and the drawers and so forth and the, the cloth and the fabric. And my um, protagonist, the woman, she makes soaps. So I had to go back and research how soap was made in the mid 19th century and how did they you know, gather, how did they go into the forest and forage for the scents and things that would make the sense and so forth. The research, and I think that that's, um, if you're going to stretch yourself, you have to empower yourself with research. Yeah, you can't just go write an Afro-Latina if you're not Afro-Latina, if you have not gotten in there and, and, and got your feet muddy and you, just, you understand what I'm saying? I think you, it, you have to, that's the beauty of a library. You guys are a library, Rochester Hills Public Library, right? 
people have to read and research and immerse themselves before they can even begin to think about what somebody else is thinking or feeling or being. You understand what I'm saying? That's why when I took on uh, the thing about writing a 19th century um, uh, woman living in Colorado with a, an exiled uh, British lover, I mean, that was so far from my reality, but the challenge was wonderful because I got to read all this stuff. I got to explore. I got to uh, get into, you can't imagine how many uh, novels and, and research books that I read just to get there. I mean, yeah, writing shades was easier because I grew up with this, but it was not without research either because I had to understand a lot of people who weren't me. You know what I mean? I had to think about, like, because Manolo, the character, is, is a young Puerto Rican male. I've never been a young Puerto Rican male, <laughs> you know what I mean? And who is dealing with, you know, his sexuality. So, I mean, that was, to me, that, that's, that's a big stretch. I happen to be a heterosexual uh, Afro-Latino female, which is still a different thing. Is that making sense? But yeah. I think we are. Yeah, I think we all need to explore the innards of others. We need to, so we can feel what other people feel and we won't be so quick to judge externally. Is that making sense? I oh, know. I, I, no, absolutely. Um, the, 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 you said the key word from, from my last bit was uh, research and, and you, I think you developed that quite well and the, it, it puts us in the mindset in in the shoes of our characters. Uh, we can't we can't really tell a good story without doing proper research. And many times, and I'm sure you do this, you you go in with one mindset of what someone's background might be that you research could even be a topic that you research, and you find yourself viewing it differently than you thought mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. would. You, yeah. You, so um, it's a learning experience. It, it helps writers um, tell the stories and it makes us very open-minded and, uh, and a little more worldly, not to pat ourselves on the back, but we're forced to experience this and put ourselves in, in those different characters' shoes. So, um, so I think you're leading up to uh, a, a reading from that new book, correct? Oh, no, I wasn't going to read from that new book. I was going to read from my new book of poetry. Because, you know, I, I have like, what, three or four books of poetry also, um, published by different publishers. But I just finished, uh, it's not a whole book, it's a chat book of poetry called Boulders. Um, that's what I was going to read from. Um, did you have something? Uh, well, Boulders, okay. Um, we're Michiganians, right? I don't know. You guys might be Michiganders, but I'm a Michiganian. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a goose. But anyway, sometimes. Anyway, um, but, and, and Michigan is a beautiful state. I mean, we've got hills and water and green stuff and orchards and beautiful state. A lot of nature. And a lot of the poetry that's written by Michiganians tends to be nature poems. But a lot of those people are not people of color because most of us are in the city, most specifically in Detroit, which is almost like an island because you've got all this other stuff and then you've got Detroit, okay? So I decided to write nature poems about Detroit and that's been fun. Uh, so I was gonna read you some of the nature poems uh, if you want to hear them. Yeah, I think that would be a, a nice treat. <laughs> Nature poems of Detroit. I, I can only guess, but I'm waiting to hear. You so can this guess? What can you, I want to know what your guess is. What's your guess? Well, I'm, I'm thinking sidewalks that might be overgrown with grass. That's nature. I'm thinking empty lots that have been converted into farms or little gardens. I'm thinking oh, cool. rooftop gardens. Huh. Okay, so I'm, I'm well, I... Kind of, 
blend nature into into an urban setting. So um, I don't know if I'm on target or a little off. Well, those are great ideas. I think I have to write some more poems <laughs> because those are great ideas. I sort of like I just I was since, since the other two was so like heavy. I was going to read some funny stuff, and um, so you want to? I mean, uh, I like nature is broad. Okay, but nature is kind of broad to me because, like, I am a Detroiter, and nature. Uh, I just start. Um, I wanted to start with like winter, and then do spring and summer. Just winter, spring, a summer poem. Okay, and this. Uh, these are short. I'm scared to read them now because they're not sidewalk crags and things. <laughs> no, rooftop I'm gardens. For the I'm scared now. Okay. Nature is a broad, a broad definition of nature. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here's the first one. It, it's called D dot wins again. Do you know what D dot is? That's yeah, well, the bus system. Right. Okay. okay, I gotta, see now I'm scared to read because I don't have nature. <laughs> don't be scared to read. I'm, I'm excited to hear what the poems Joe are. Joe will like this. This has film references. Uh, so this is for you, Joe. Okay. <laughs> All right. D dot wins again. Ain't nothing like up south cold when the sidewalks are crunchy with day old snow that hides strips of ice like suicidal skateboards for newbies while wind slices at your nose and knees and legs and cheek like you're Janet Lee taking a shower. Ain't nothing like up south cold when your car is up on bricks and you gotta be somewhere, but DDOT makes Hal's Odyssey look like a Fast and Furious sequel and your toes are lumps of ice as you trudge to the bus stop with the wind howling in protest. Ain't nothing like up south cold when you're shivering at the stop, looking like Jodie Foster's iris with icicles dangling from your lashes, hands crammed into the pockets of your bomber jacket, short skirt whipping at your frosted thighs and encrusted mucklucks playing host to popsicles as the hour late bus now full, rolls pass without stopping. <laughs> that happened to me before. <laughs> have you ever been? Okay, you, you probably haven't caught a bus in a while. I haven't caught it in a while, but that happened to me when I was younger. In a cold, because we got the worst transit system in the country. And my students complain all the time. That's why they're late because they wait for the bus and the bus is full and it rides past them. But Detroit can get bitterly cold. Okay, so that's sort of nature, no? No, it is, absolutely. It's, it's the harsh reality of, um, of winter and it, it comes every year. And uh, some people look forward to it and some people endure it, but it's the beauty of living in a state with all four seasons. Exactly. That's why I'm still here. Okay. Now here's a spring one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's called Condo Aviary. And actually this, uh, this is uh, posted on, there was a, a bird, a nature site, and I, they actually posted this on their thing. But anyway, also it's meant to be funny. Okay. It's three in the morning and I awake to the incessant tweet, tweet, twittering of a sparrows in concert with the trill twisting chirp, 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 the chorus that fills the night air. At least roosters wait till daylight. The lone street light reveals a black beak cardinal goose-stepping along a naked spring branch. His scarlet feathers a shaky blur as his impoverished cousin, a robin, pecks idly at the stingy patio grass that disappears under the wrought iron table tucked tight against the siding since the first snowfall. Its victimized chairs are splotched white with droppings. Later, 
dive bombing seagulls will decorate the parking lot in polka dots before congregating in corners to converse and look for scraps as a bouquet of pheasants saunter down the winding bike trail and a silent hawk spreads, wings spread, blacks out the sky, hunting prey. Now, that is, I live in a, I live in a cooperative in downtown Detroit. There are five cooperatives, you know, because when the, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the structure. Um, when Mayor Young was in office, he tried to make the Lafayette Park area a multi-economic area because he figured if you had people who were wealthy, working class people along with poor people, you would have a better society. It kind of worked and kind of didn't. Um, but a lot of the um, condo structures turned into cooperatives when times got hard. So we, we uh, these, are, these are cooperatives, but I, I'm giving you more than you need, but there was a ravine nearby and it went um, feral. So you've got all kinds of birds and animals. Uh, we've got raccoons, we've got um, uh, just foxes, pheasants and so forth. So even though we live in an urban setting, we have all kinds of birds. You, you would be surprised. Have you, have you guys ever been down here? I mean, so you're familiar, Joe, with the area because it's, uh, right now it's the Quinder Cut now. They call it the Quinder Cut now, but it used to be an abandoned railroad area. That's a ravine. And so it just populated the area. So you can see almost any kind of bird or, I mean, I, I heard spottings of, uh, of a coyote not far away. So we uh, have a lot of wildlife in the area. You wouldn't know. Well, wildlife that. is good. Yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I think I could do with fewer squirrels. <laughs> what have the squirrels ever done to you? <laughs> Are you serious? We have so many squirrels, and, and we have a lot of greenery, and you have to like duck under the trees as they run across. And it's just. They're everywhere. They don't have any, I don't think they have enough predators after them because they populate just willy nilly. <laughs> and we've got gray squirrels, we've got brown squirrels, we've got black squirrels, we've got big squirrels, we've got little squirrels. I tell you, <laughs> it's, you wouldn't, people don't realize it, but there are all kinds of uh, wildlife in this area. I know, more than you wanted to know. That's okay. Uh, so we've covered um, winter and uh, we've covered spring and you're going to do one more season for us? Yes, I'm going to do summer. I like this one a lot. This is called Belle Isle. You know what Belle Isle is? Yeah. Yes. Belle Isle. Oh, I don't know. I know if you're a Michiganian, you probably know, but people outside don't know what Belle Isle is. Yeah, okay. I've been there a few times. It's a state park now. For the next hundred years. <laughs> or I don't know, they, 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 uh, the state park leased it for a period of time. I don't know what it is, but it, it's, they don't own it. The, still, the city still owns it, but the state sort of leases it for like a dollar a year or something. Right. Anyway. Okay, so this takes place at Belle Isle. It's called Belle Isle, yeah. Aunt Myrna lost her cherry and her shoes on Belle Isle. And I hear she wasn't the only one because it's a place for first and seconds and slow drives in circles along the shoreline with kids hanging out of car windows, shouting and licking ice cream cones, signs, seat belts, or their parents blast the radio, or for casting a rod off a long wooden wharf, trying to catch fish you probably shouldn't eat, or for games of cricket played by dark-skinned men dressed in white who laugh in island accents or maybe a quick game of nine holes on a shaggy course, or a windblown boathouse wedding with a long, silky bride like a Modigliani model drifting down a winding stream in a canoe followed by a duck squawking at its trail of ducklings while a hawk circles overhead. Or you could find somebody you like 
And when it gets dark, tuck your car into a forested lane and search for cherries or peaches or lost shoes while deer look on, nose pressed to foggy windows. I heard that the island used to be overrun by snakes, so hogs were brought over to get rid of them. But I'm sure they're all gone now, because it's been a few hundred years. Okay, summer. And that's true about my aunt. Don't tell her I told you. <laughs> I believe every word you say, Esperanza. <laughs> well, no, she hasn't heard the poem yet. She would probably slap me if she did. <laughs> but that's, that's a, um, it used to be a place for first, I heard. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I don't know. You have to, I mean, it used to be, it's kind of, I mean, when I was a kid, they had canoes and horses. Uh, the, the golf range used to be, actually, they used to cut the grass. Um, and the boat houses were huge and painted up beautifully. And they had all kinds of boats and so forth. Um, it was just a beautiful place to go. It's gone down because the city doesn't have any money and the state really hasn't invested in anything. So it's pretty much in the same shape. The state has had it for a few years now. And it's pretty much the same. But when I was a kid, it used to be such a fabulous place because they have Scott Fountain and the lights used to be under the lights and it would go pink and green and blue with the water falling. And, and I don't know, it was just, you know, you, you had the, uh, what do you call it? The arborarium? What do you call the place with the plants? Is it an arborarium? Um, terrarium? What is it? Uh, you know, the, with the plants? Yeah, there's the, it's is it a botanical closed. garden? And, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's like a botanical garden thing, but there's a thing that you, but at any rate, um, it used to be, you know, a place where you had family reunions and so forth, but it's kind of scraggly and the boathouses are falling down and it's kind of, we had hoped that the state would invest some money into it, but they really haven't. You know, so, but at any rate, it's still cool. So um, we've, we've covered uh, three seasons. Is there, are there um, fall stories in, in boulders? I didn't, I don't know. I really didn't. I, I only plan to read those. <laughs> I, that, I think. That's okay. I was just curious on if you covered all four seasons in that book. Well, you've given me some other ideas. Maybe I'll add, because I've only, it's a chat book right now. It's only uh, probably about 30 pages. Um, and I'll probably add to it, but it's just, you know, sometimes person, I, I, I'm, I'm usually writing like at least seven or eight different things at once, you know, but I'm also teaching. I'm teaching five classes a semester, which is really crazy. So when I um, need to a break from class, I'll work on whatever it is I'm writing to sort of like a cathartic kind of thing. So I'll probably be adding to this because this semester is really making my head hurt, you know, with these students and being online. And as I was telling Joe, I'm trying to teach this film class online and I don't have any films to show. And <laughs> it's like... we have lots of, lots of challenges right now, but, at least we can turn to authors like you for some reading material that uh, is so lovely. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you, Michael. And I want to remind everyone that we are speaking with Esperanza Centrone. Um, she is the author of Shades Detroit Love Stories. Uh, that's a kind of a new book that's out. It uh, came out last year, right? Yeah, August of 19. And um, that, that was our first readings that you, you gave us today. And then Boulders, is that out now or is that going to be coming out? No, up? I'm submitting it. I've been submitting it to different places. Um, you know, with poetry, I mean, like I, this would be my fourth book of poetry, but um, it's one of those things where uh, it's, it's harder because it doesn't make any money at all, you know, <laughs> unless, I mean, unless you're into Sakishenge or somebody big or, you know, but it's, uh, it's, I just started submitting it like a couple months ago. So hopefully maybe next year I can get somebody to publish it. 
Yeah. And then uh, let's revisit uh, your your Western mystery. <laughs> yes, is that's that out called. There? That's I actually I just got an agent that's looking at it. She I just sent her the final edit, and uh, we'll see what happens with that. But it's called I Don't Swoon, because you know you you, <laughs> you you know how you see in the Western times all these ladies going oh you know they're fainting or whatever. Well, this young woman she says I don't swoon. It start it opens up actually. She's delivering, she does washing, you know, for a living. And she's, it's dawn and she's delivering her washing. And she stumbles over uh, the town preacher who's dead. His body is, is in front of the whorehouse, right? She's taking the, the whorehouse, their linen, right? And she's like, oh my goodness, this is a dead white man. And I'm a black woman. Let me get out of here. And that's when she says, I don't swoon. I can't be falling all over this. I have to like. Come, get away from this situation and it's all about uh, it's all about you know how they eventually who murdered the the men the the preacher right uh the the murder of the preacher propels the story but in so doing you get to know her you get to know patrick who is her lover you get to know the town which is called calvary which is a town i made up of course but um i have to say it was so fun writing that book it was really fun. It was a lot of work because the edits are the worst thing. But the creating the characters and the town and stuff and doing the research, it was just, it was just wonderful. Uh, but like I said, when you're doing the editing, the rewrites are the ones that tear you up. And I must have rewritten that thing 30 times before I finally came up with a, a version that I thought was worthy of letting others read, <laughs> you know. Right. Now, is yeah. this your first um, first attempt into that genre of um, mystery? No, actually, um, I've written a number of short uh, mysteries that I've been submitting to. Um, I, so I've, I've been writing these short mysteries that uh, um, I, I'm putting into a book. But it's, it's one of those things, you know, since I'm just this, I had, I used to have an agent. I used to write, <laughs> I used to write romance and I had an agent when I was writing romance and I, you know, made a little money. I sold some stuff to Harlequin and so forth, but I no longer have that agent. So selling my, getting myself out there myself is a little hard. That's why I end up at publishers like Wayne State, which is a wonderful place to get your work published. But again, you don't make a lot of money. You just, you know get recognition so i'm trying to sell the mysteries to you know publishers that are going to pay me some money <laughs> i'd like you know a little return on my efforts right you know? but it takes a little longer i um going back to to, to shades detroit love stories um i love the fact that you put in the front the definition of the word shade shades right and I've never seen that in a book. And, and when I read through the definition, I was surprised because I, I didn't think about how complex that word is and how it yeah. means so many things. And again, I think you used it just brilliantly in the fact that oh, that's what your stories are. They're complex and they mean so many different things. That, um, that's something, that's a sort of a trademark of mine. The, I do that with a lot of with my other books too. I'll take the word, and um, I'm just, where am I? I don't know where my other books. Here, wait a minute. These are some of my other books, but with um, I think it was this one. What keeps me sane? Um, uh, this this one won the Naomi Long Magic. It's it's a book of poetry, and there's there uh, narrative poems. There's stories about women, but in poet form. But I took the word sanity, and I did the same thing that I did with uh, with shades because yeah, words are nuanced. Words, words. I am agreeing with you. I'm saying words are nuanced. They have levels of meaning, and if you want your audience to really understand the scope of it. You want, I, I don't know, I guess you have to help them um, do it. But I like to do that with my books. I'll take one of the words and try to break it down 
and find the levels. Did I cut you off? I'm sorry, Michael. No, no, it's, it's, we're here to listen to you talk. So it's, thank you. Um, I, th I just, I was marveled at, at um, reading the definitions and, and, and as writers, we often look in the dictionary and, and, you know, see that a word has one or two or three uh, meanings. Um, and I think we're always surprised at, oh yeah, that's right. This word also means this. And if I use it as a verb, it means that. And, you know, connecting the definition to the stories of shades um, made so much sense to me. It's because it, it really does cast that shadow or put you in darkness or cool you off the different meanings behind the word in connection with your stories. Yeah, the cultural meanings too, because in African-American culture, um, you're dealing with, even in Latino culture, you're dealing with the hierarchy of shades in terms of skin tones. You know, you've got um, the closer you are, the lighter you are, the closer you are to power because the closer you are to the white man. The darker you are, the less power, the less benefits you have. And that tends to be a hierarchical structure in, in any colonized uh, ethnic group. Okay, if you're talking Latinos, if you're talking, if you even if you look at India, they were colonized by the British. So therefore, the lighter you are, the more privileges you have. So shades in that sense, but also in African American culture, a shade is a hank, a ghost. Okay, so there's that sense of of the the otherworldliness, the occult, or so forth, um, when you're dealing with the concept of shades. Okay, so I, I think that a lot of people might be familiar, familiar with the dictionary, you know, the, the Merriam-Webster, but I thought it was important to bring in, uh, I guess, anthropological, spiritual, uh, political um, clarifications of the term too, because those are the things that are underlying in the story, understanding the cultural references, understanding uh, the spiritual references. Because even though I am not, um, I am not like a Christian or anything, you know, I'm agnostic. There's a lot of spirituality in my stories, a lot of God stuff in my stories because of the, um, it permeates the culture or the cultures. Right. Yeah. And it, when you're writing your stories, whether it's poetry or, or a, a feature novel length is it important to you or is it important for all authors to include a message in the storytelling to to educate as well as entertain that's an interesting question uh, i teach creative writing and we talk about that because you know uh um uh, i'm trying to remember the oscar wilde group because you know oscar wilde uh turn of the century brit uh, because that whole group, they were against having messages. They said that it was basically um, um, low class to think that work had to have a message. But then if you go to uh, the BAM movement, which is, which is the Black Arts movement of the 1970s, they said that it is not art unless it, especially it's not Black art, if it does not have a message that promotes the people. I don't know, I'm somewhere in between. I, I think that, um, I, I don't think that, I think that uh, there's probably going to be a message whether you want it to be there or not, because we all have beliefs and ideas that are going to uh, permeate our works, right? I, I don't know if you even have to intentionally meet, because I don't, I don't sit around and intentionally say, this is the message I'm going to say. But inherently, um, the things that I believe in are going to be there. And any reader with any sensibility is going to feel it or sense it or, you know what I mean? I, I think it, I don't want to be pedantic. So I don't go forth and say, oh, I want this. This is what I mean. But I want you to feel something. I want you to see something. Well, we can't help that ourselves work its way into the writing. And it's important that we are free in our writing and our creative outlet. It could be 
any art, right? Painting or sculpture or okay. poetry. Um, we are in that work. And we as a people have a message and maybe some people have a stronger message and maybe some people yell their message. Uh, but we try to subtly exactly. um, weave it into our tales and, uh, and, yeah. and you know, characters that we write have their own message. We don't even know mm -hmm. what that is until they tell us. Yeah, because you know the poem Ars Poetica, Archibald MacLeese, and and the art, uh, the Oscar Wilde group that was called the Arts for Arts Sake group. They said that it, you shouldn't have a message, but even when in writing Ars Poetica, he has a message saying that you shouldn't have a message. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like even though he's saying no message, it's inherent in what he's writing. So it, how can you not? Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's kind of a, we're human beings. And so therefore, uh, that humanity is going to come out of our pores. I mean, I don't know. And anyway, I did, uh, yeah. Uh, what can you say? So what else? Well, I think um, we can say that our message today, uh, if for all the readers that are tuning in, is to read more, to read more diversity. <laughs> And, and to read some of your books, Esperanza, Esperanza Centron. Um, where might people find your books? I'm sure they're available in most of the libraries. I know we have them at the Rochester Hills Public Library, as well as bookstores. Yeah, uh, they're all available. Of course, everything's available on Amazon. <laughs> but, but yeah, at the bookstores, at any bookstore, um, I think that the only one, I think that this, my first book, which is Chocolate City Latina, I think it's out of print, but there might be, you know, the others are available elsewhere, but, you know, most, they're, yeah, libraries, bookstores, wherever. I mean, okay. I, I, do we have any, I was hoping we had maybe. I think we have some people tuning in that have questions. So I think let's encourage um, any, anyone listening that they can put in the chat box uh, their questions. I don't know if we need to turn over to, to Joe. Do you want to read some questions for oh, Esperanza? Sure. Um, I know we got at least one question here um, from Phyllis. And I think this is pertaining to one of the questions after, uh, I, I think this is after the summer uh, reading, uh, or I think like Bell, the Belle Isle poem, uh, they asked, what is a chat book? Oh, um, yeah, normally a, 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 a full length of poetry, book of poetry runs uh, 48 to maybe 100 pages, whereas a chat book usually runs 35 and less. And those are terms that publishers tend to use, and especially if you're interest, entering contests and so forth, um, a chat book is smaller. It's cheaper to print, <laughs> so because it has fewer pages. And uh, normally a lot of contests will just ask for a chat book. Um, whereas publishers, larger publishers, publish um, the longer books. So, I mean, yeah. Do you know where the word chat comes from? It's, um, I don't know, but it's chat, C-H-A-P book. And I don't chap. know, chap, yeah. I don't know where that comes from. So a chap book. Yeah. And I have no idea. I was like, you know, but it's just a smaller book of poetry, fewer poems, you know. I, you know what, maybe, I don't know, but you remember like the, the 1950s when you had Ginsburg and all of those guys, the beat poets, they used to put out a lot of chat books because, you know, uh, City Lights, which was their poetry, I mean, which was their publisher, was like a little small book where they just put things together, you know, and it was cheaper to print smaller books than, you know, the bigger books. I don't know if that's where it started. But I know that uh, City Lights and the, the Beat Poets with Ginsburg and, you know, Ferlinghetti and those guys, they had uh, smaller books. I wonder if it refers to chapter. Um, it might, actually. Oh, like a chapter. 
Yeah. yeah. I've always just known that it meant a smaller uh, bit of writing, a, you know, a, a smaller form, less words writing. Um, but I didn't know where the name came from. So I thought we could bring that up. Ah, I see Sarah says, Sarah, thank you. Yes, too many squirrels. So I take it you're not a feeder of squirrels. I love you, Sarah. Because <laughs> people feed the squirrels and they come back in. <laughs> but I was, that just, I had to say thank you to, because people think I'm mean, but you don't live here with these squirrels, man. <laughs> My family feeds birds, so they uh, they know the frustration of just being overrun by squirrels. They they feed them. See, okay, that's what they get. What they deserve. Well, they, they feed the birds, but the squirrels come and steal it. Yeah. See, see, we've got fruit trees over here, which I'm like, I don't know who planted these doggone fruit trees. So they have a bounty. They can eat apples and other things, you know. So, I don't know. Uh, look, I did look up chat books while we were talking here, and it does seem uh, that it dates back to, like, the early 19th century, and it mm. seems to derive from the word for an itinerant salesman who would sell these kinds of books. Uh, they would be called Chapman. Oh, wow. It comes from the Old English, I think, chap, like, uh, to barter business or dealing, from which the modern adjective cheap was subsequently derived. Look at you! <laughs> is that English? Is that English is in British or English is in American? Uh, I think English is in British, like Old English. Okay, that I never knew that. So it means cheap. Uh, yeah, the, they or at least they have similar origins. Okay. And now that you've said that, Joe, I, I do remember that definition um, before I had forgotten what it meant, but that does make sense. So it's, it's the smaller format book that would be uh, pitched by a, by a salesman, much like door to door or a street corner. So that, that would, yeah, that falls right into the beat poets and making the little cheap books because it was cheaper to, to um, make and they could sell it for like three dollars or something. I know that um, one time, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Mama Amir Baraka, he used to be Leroy Jones. He came here and uh, his son was with him to Detroit and they had printed off some copies like on a Xerox machine and his son was selling uh, these at the reading for like eight bucks and they were like little Xerox things and I was like oh my goodness <laughs> I just I don't know whether I should have bought one because it would have been a collector's copy or whether I should have been offended so <laughs> but anyway I think I'm kind of used up are you guys like if you don't have any more questions uh, I, I did have one quick question. Uh, just uh, uh, I know a lot of media, uh, like either like documentaries about Detroit or like a lot of fiction that uses Detroit as a setting. A lot of them are kind of interested in viewing Detroit from this lens of kind of ruin or like it's like, you know, abandoned or decrepit. But a lot of your story, like, you know, so many of your stories from this, from Shades are full of like life and just the complexity and personalities in Detroit. Uh, is that kind of popular perception of Detroit something that like you had in mind as you were writing? Is that something you thought you might want to combat or? Uh, oh, no, no. Yeah. You know, Joe, I love this city. This is my favorite city in the world. And I've been to Beijing, Paris. I've been to lots of other cities. I love this city. My daughter, who I told you is about your age, will go down to the North End and I'll be going over to someone's house and we'll pass a, a ruined building, as you call it. Mm -hmm. I don't see a ruined building, hon. I see a place where B.B. King used to play his guitar and my mama used to hang out there. You know what I'm saying? I see the mansion that that um, that um, the Motown, what's this, Barry Gordy used to live in. You know, I I mean, this city is is alive for me. I I see uh, 
the roller, the roller rink where the kids used to hang out, you know, it may be an empty building now and it probably won't be an empty building tomorrow because property property values are ridiculous. Now they have tripled my property values for my, my condo has tripled since we've been uh, gentrified. Okay. But my thing is that this city has always and is alive to me. I see things that I guess a lot of people since, since I grew up here, it's like, you can talk to me, you can take me on any side of town and I will tell you stories about those places that may seem like abandoned buildings to you, but I remember the people. I remember what it used to look like. I remember the grandeur, do you know what I mean? So no, yeah, I heard, I see people come in and take what they call ruin porn pictures because you know, people get off on seeing the ruination of things, but I don't see that. I see, I mean, because actually, I used to live in New York, uh, upstate New York, and I used to take the train. So I remember what the train station looked like before it be, you know what I mean? I actually caught a train from there. So yeah, people to me who are into ruined porn are short-sighted and have short memories. And I think that they ought to talk to some of us who lived here, grew up here, and who appreciate this place. I used to work for, I know, see, you got me started. I used to work for the city county, okay? I worked for Eberhard, and this was in the 80s, right? One of my jobs was to go out to the factories that were closing and attend the union meetings. I saw grown men, you know, crying because they were losing their jobs. You know what I mean? I saw the factories close. But then again, I also saw when the factories were thriving, you know, when the eagle flew every Friday. So my thing is like, no, my city is alive and well. I don't care what y'all see because I know what I see. Okay. This is a beautiful city. My favorite city. Thanks for bringing up because I I needed to say that, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I I, (laughs) I was just wondering if that kind of had inspired the writing because we need a lot more work like that that shows like, there's more to this city than just like days gone by. There are people that live here and lives yes. that go on every day. Yeah. I came back in 93. I had just gotten my doctorate and I came back and I moved down here. Okay. And honestly, it was perfect because it was like living in a small town. I didn't have to worry about traffic. I felt safe in my community. This was 1993. I remember catching the train down and this little old white lady says to me, you live in Detroit? Don't you worry about those fires? Because apparently there used to be fires uh, on Devil's Night or so forth, you know? (laughs) And I'm like, what fires? Because apparently the news had blown it up that the whole city was burning or whatever. And there were a few abandoned houses. And actually what was happening was that people had moved out to the suburbs. They couldn't rent out those houses. And in order to correct, collect the insurance, they burned the houses down and said the kids burn them. Okay. But this little lady, she didn't know all this. And I was truly insulted. And I had to say, lady, I don't know what you're talking about. Because when people talk about my city, I will stand up for it because I am a Detroit booster. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I don't know. I have worn your ears out, all of you. I'm sorry, but you know. (laughs) It's been our pleasure, Esperanza Centron, to be here with you tonight, uh, this afternoon, um, talking about your book, uh, uh, Shades, Detroit Love Stories. It's available. Um, at the Rochester Hills Public Library and probably all your local libraries and yeah. bookstores. So I encourage you to check it out. Would you like to leave one final message uh, to the audience today, Esperanza? Thanks. Thanks for coming and listening and putting up with me. And yeah, you know, <laughs> that's all. Thanks. You know. Oh, we were glad to have you. This is a wonderful program. I think it was a really enlightening and fun experience. Got to hear a lot of wonderful stories from a really great point of view. I hope everybody will come check out that book. And we thank you all for being here today. And we hope to see you all at more of our programs. Uh, we have another at 2 p.m. tomorrow uh, for the Curtis Taylor program. 
And again, I will thank you, Esperanza Centron, for joining us and Michael Dwyer as well for joining us. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.